Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Today, we are going to wrap up our series on defining faith. This is part number seven. We haven't even got out of the first verse today. Here is the 11th chapter, verse number one. Turn there with me in your Bibles. This is Defining Faith, part number seven. I want to refresh your thinking about where we've been in this series so that today you'll understand where we've come from and where we're going. Today's message will stand on its own, and I believe that the Spirit of God's going to speak to you and you'll be encouraged right where we're at. But I want to just kind of remind you and kind of refresh your memories. You remember in part number one, Defining Faith, we defined faith. We found out from Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number one, that if ever there was a biblical definition of faith, it would be here in Hebrews 11, verse number one. That faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. You remember we said that faith is our beliefs. It's our convictions. It's what moves us. It's what moves goods and services in the kingdom of God. Then we said, well, if that's what faith is, then how does faith come? Well, we remember part number two. We said that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we hear the word, we receive it into our hearts, we accept it as true, and now it becomes a part of our life. Then Pastor Luke brought part number three. If you remember, we said that faith must be released, that you can't just hold on to our faith, we can't just have it on the inside. It was like that illustration of the seeds in the bag, that if the seeds stay in the bag, they do no good, so we have to release our faith. And we said, well, how do we do that? And it was very simple, and we release it in two ways, what we say and what we do. So in our lives, if we speak the word of God, then our faith is being released. If we're walking in obedience to the word of God, then our faith is being released. And then you remember we said that our faith must be fed, that in order to not abandon our beliefs, that we have to feed our faith. We said, well, okay, how do we feed our faith? Same two things, only now it's not us word, but now it's God word, that whatever God says and whatever God does, we feed our faith on the word of God, those same scriptures that built our faith, as well as the faithfulness of God, feeding on God's faithfulness. Then you remember part number five, we got together and we said that we must be led by faith, that we couldn't just sit back and be led by the calculations, we couldn't add it up and be led by what we can see in the natural. No, this is a supernatural experience. You don't know how you're gonna make it, don't, don't understand it, can't calculate it out, it, it, it doesn't add up, but by faith, we follow the word of God and that God leads us and guides us in our everyday life. We walk by faith and not by sight. Then last time we got together, Pastor Luke brought a great message about the fight of faith, that we need to put on the whole armor of God, that we can stand in the evil day. And no other way you're going to stand except by faith. Today, I want to do something that we have not yet done in this series, and that is I want to go to verse number two. (laughs) Hallelujah. The monumental day. Mark it in your Bibles. Hebrews 11, chapter, verse number two. says these words. It says, for by it, by what? What are we talking about? faith, right? For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Now, that word testimony in other translations might say a good report, or it might say they obtained a good reputation. The bottom line for all of us is that we're not just defining what faith is, but our faith is defining us. And we have to make a determination and a decision. What do we want our lives to be defined as? When all of it's said and all of it's done and we wrap it up here on the earth, what do we want people to say about us? And even more importantly, what do we want God to say about us? Because that is the report, that is the testimony that matters the most. There was a guy in 1888 who uh, went out and grabbed the newspaper and sat down and started to read. And much to his surprise, when he got to the obituaries, he found his own obituary there in the newspaper. He was shocked. In fact, it was an error that had taken place. The reporter who was reporting this obituary got it wrong. It was actually this man's brother who passed away, but he reported about his death. So he decided to read on and see what they had to say about him, and he was a very wealthy man. He was an inventor. He invented dynamite. And so they started to talk about how he was wealthy and how he made his fortune with dynamite and and weapons of destruction and how he was an arms dealer and and how he was a, a manufacturer of death. And he was just... Uh, uh, just shocked by this report. He he couldn't understand why he had this sort of a life, this sort of a reputation that was spoken of him because he really was a, a person who wanted to advance education and science and knowledge and goodness and peace. And he saw all the good things that dynamite could do, how you could move mountains, how you could open up things, how you could, you know, advance technology with it. And yet they didn't remember him that way. 
And so right then and there, he made a decision that that was not going to be his legacy, that he was going to change what people thought of him. And so he sunk his fortune and his efforts on the earth for the rest of his days into making sure that his legacy and his life mattered for something. And so he started to award and prize uh, different advances in education and science and in economics in different areas. And we know him today, this great man by the name of Alfred Nobel, as the founder of the Nobel Peace Prize. And now that's his legacy. See, in our lives, as we live a life of faith, our faith will define us. It will show who we are. And when we leave this earth, we will leave it with an impact here on earth, but it will go far beyond us into eternity because our faith will define us and we will do great and mighty things for God. That's what the life of faith is all about. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 2, when it says that they obtained a good testimony, in the original language, that whole phrase is just one word. And it's the same word where we get our word for martyr. You know a martyr, very prevalent in our day and age. Somebody who's a witness of Jesus Christ. Somebody who would lay down their life for their beliefs. And we all need to ask ourselves this question, am I willing, am I ready to die for what I believe? Am I really ready to stake it all on what I believe from the word of God? I love what Martin Luther King Jr. had to say. He said these words that if a man has not discovered something that he will die for, he isn't fit to live. He paid the ultimate price for what he believed. And we need to ask ourselves, am I willing to die for what I believe? Am I willing to stake it all, all of my life, all of my wealth, all of my resources, everything that I have, even my reputation on the word of God? See, faith isn't just a means of getting stuff even though you can obtain things by faith. And that's fine, but that's not all it is. That's the most basic level of faith. Our faith moves us. Our faith guides us. Our faith directs us. Our faith will define us. We live by it, and we walk by it. So today, I want to talk to you about obtaining a good report. See, that's really what this is all about. When we live a life of faith, the one thing that we want to obtain when all is said and done, doesn't matter how much wealth we amassed here on earth, how much fame and fortune, all that kind of stuff, listen, that's all going to burn when Jesus comes back. What really matters is the report that's said about us here on earth and into eternity, obtaining a good report by faith. A couple of things that I want to discuss with you today. First one is this, is that we have to choose faith in everyday life. It's a choice. We can choose faith in everyday life. See, faith is like a golden chain that holds all the pearls of our life together and adorns our neck. Faith gives substance to hope, evidence to the unseen, encourages obedience, teaches patience to wait, and gives the lifeblood to the word of God flowing in us. That's what faith does. It orders our life. It arranges everything. And we have to choose faith. And that faith will hold us together and define us. I'm reminded of the story of a woman who made a choice and after her husband had died. Husband had died and left her uh, his fortune and put everything in order for his passing. She was talking to her friends about it. And her friends were saying, well, tell us about him. You know, he's a great man and, and we want to hear about what happened. She says, oh, he was awesome. He was wonderful. He even arranged everything for his passing. And they said, really, how did he do that? And she said, well, he left me three envelopes. Oh, that's interesting. What were in the envelopes? Well, the first envelope, when I opened it up, I found $5,000 in it. And a note that said, use this $5,000 to buy a casket for my body. So she says, I went out with that $5,000 and I bought a mahogany casket, brass rails for the pallbearers to hold. I made sure that it was plush on the inside so that he'd be comfortable in his final resting place. And they said, wow. Well, what about the second envelope? She said, well, the second envelope, it just got better. There was $10,000 in the second envelope. They said, really? Yeah, and there was a note in that envelope, and it said, I want you to provide for my funeral expenses with this $10,000. So I went out, and I made sure to hire the best minister that I could find, and I had the best musicians playing his favorite songs there at the funeral service. I had a seven-gun salute and doves that were released, and, and we had the best food at the reception afterwards. Now our friends were getting excited. They said, well, what about the third envelope? She said, oh, the third envelope. Just let me know how good he was. Because in the third envelope, there was $25,000 in that envelope. And they said, $25,000? My goodness, that's a lot of money. What did the note say? And she says, oh, yeah, the note. Well, it said, with this $25,000, buy a stone. She held up her ring finger with a 10-carat diamond on it and said, well, do you like my stone? <laughs> Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number one, it says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. 
and loving favor rather than silver and gold. See, we need to choose our reputation. You can choose faith each and every day of your life above the 10 carat diamond ring. Come on, somebody. See, and it will yield far better returns. It will bless your life far longer and far greater than any wealth we could amass here on the earth. There's a tombstone in England of a cavalier soldier with the epitaph, he served King Charles with a constant, dangerous, and expensive loyalty. That should be said of every Christian, every person that names Jesus as their Lord, that they serve their King Jesus with, a, a, with an expensive, with a dangerous, and with a constant loyalty. We need to choose faith every day. Can you say amen? amen. Obtaining a good report. First thing is that we have to choose faith in everyday life. We make that choice. Second thing is this, is that we've got to keep the faith switch turned on. We've got to keep the faith switch Turned on. What do I mean by that? Well, you're there in Hebrews chapter 11. Turn with me to the book of James. James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1. Very familiar scripture when talking about faith. In fact, we've already been in these verses in the series. I want to bring out a little bit different aspect of what James, the first chapter, is talking about. James chapter number 1, starting in verse number 6, the context of what he's talking about is asking God for wisdom. Now, we can apply this to every area of our life. Because we don't only ask God for wisdom, sometimes we ask him for provision, sometimes we ask him for direction, sometimes we ask him for blessings, sometimes we ask him for uh, physical healing. There's tons of stuff that we can ask God for. And look at verse number six, he says, but let him ask in faith. So if you're going to ask God for wisdom or ask God for anything, let him ask in faith with no doubting. Now, you remember Pastor Luke brought out that this is not just I don't know how it's going to happen because we've had those thoughts and we said, oh no, am I doubting? Have I, have I missed it? Have I made a mistake? But really that word is talking about separating, completely going away. That God, now you're saying uh, God's not real. He's not God. He can't do it. It's not going to happen. And you have separated from your faith. So he says, if any of you last wisdom, let him ask of God, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the way, now I want you to get a picture of this in your mind. Just imagine with me for a moment. Maybe you've seen the movie Life of Pi or maybe you saw The Perfect Storm or something like that. And you remember those scenes in the movie. It's dark, it's stormy, it's cloudy. And they're looking out over the ocean and the waters are just going up and down, left and right. They're going in and out. The boat is going up and then the boat is going down. The boat really doesn't have any direction. It's just floating along wherever the current takes it. It's a scary feeling. Now, I want you to get that picture in your mind because this is really the picture that the Bible is using. No doubting, for he who doubts, he who departs from God, is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Verse number seven, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. In other words, if you're divided in your loyalty to God and you, you separate yourself from the word of God and from your faith now, now you shouldn't suppose that you will receive anything from the Lord. Verse number eight comes along and says, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Now to bring clarity to this, I read this in, in several different translations and paraphrases and I found one that I believe really amplifies what we're talking about today. See, we study from the old King James, really it's very reliable. We preach from the new King James, but sometimes we, we draw it out of different paraphrases and translations in order to really broaden our thinking. And so today I wanted to bring this to you in James chapter one, verse six through eight, from the voice, it's a paraphrase, all right? And it says these words in James chapter one, verse six through eight in the voice, it says the key is, that your request be anchored by your single-minded commitment to God. Those who depend only on their own judgment are like those lost on the seas, carried away by any wave, or picked up by any wind. Now, you've got the perfect storm image in your head. That's that image that we were talking about. Verse number seven, those adrift on their own wisdom shouldn't assume the Lord will rescue them or bring them anything. Wow. Verse number eight, and this is really where I wanted to lock in Today, verse number eight, the splinter of divided loyalty shatters your compass and leaves you dizzy and confused. Isn't that amazing? Now think about a compass for a second. We here on the Northern Hemisphere, where does our compass point to? I'm sorry, where does it point to? North, right? Now, if you're looking at a map, where does north point to? On the map, it points up, right? Okay, I'm going somewhere with this, so I need you guys to track with me. Everybody tracking? All right. Compass points north, north on a map as you're looking at it is up, right? I'm talking about keeping the faith switch turned on. For the most part, when you flip a light switch on, you're flipping it up. See, your loyalty, your focus, your attention, your faith switch needs to be turned on. And in order for it to be turned on, it's got to be flipped 
up. Thank you. See, we've got to make sure that our focus in life does not get off of the things of God, that it does not get off of the Word of God, that it does not get off the way and the will of God, the character, nature, and attributes of God, of that Word of God which He spoke to us, that He made alive to us, that promise that we were locking up with. We've got to keep the face switch turned on. Now, to further illustrate this point, I want to show this to you in the Word of God, okay? Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 14. Let me set the stage for you while we're turning there. Matthew chapter number 14. The disciples, Jesus, have been traveling and ministering. Jesus has just done miracles, signs and wonders. Amazing things have taken place. People have been ministered to. They've been fed. And now Jesus sends his disciples on ahead of him and says, I want to I meet you on the other side. And so here the disciples go on ahead of Jesus and they're straining against the oars in the night. All right, the wind and the waves have kicked up and they're, they're, they're going across the ocean. Jesus sees them down there. He starts to walk out and he starts to go towards them. But eventually he, he looks like he's going to pass them up. And so the disciples see him and they go, ah! And they cry out for fear. It's a ghost. And Jesus says, guys, stop screaming like girls. This is my translation now, okay? This is my paraphrase. <laughs> guys, stop screaming. Don't be afraid. It's me. This is where we pick up the story. Matthew chapter 14, verse number Verse number 28. Matthew chapter 14, verse number 28. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Peter's waiting for a word from God. Sees Jesus walking on the water, wants to do what Jesus is doing, but knows he can't do it in and of himself. So he says, Jesus, if it's you, command me to come out upon the water. Now look at what Jesus says, verse number 29. So he said, come. One word. One word. What happened with that one word, Peter? When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Did you know that one word from God can change your entire life? One word from God, you can step out onto the waters with nothing to support you but the word of God. Are you willing to step out in faith and believe God? See, that one word, if you've got one word about your children, you can believe God all the way into eternity. If you've got one word about your finances, you're going to make it. If you got one word about your health, you know that you will be strong and that you will be healthy. If you got one word about your future, one word about your business, one word about your sound mind, one word about judgment, one word about vision, one word about wisdom, one word about direction, it will change your entire life if you're willing to step out in faith on that one word. Now look at what happens. Verse number 30, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, some translations say the wind and the waves, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. Now we could get down on Peter at this point, couldn't we? We could say, oh, that Peter, doubting, should have known, just like every man on earth. But Peter actually does something that's interesting. Remember, we're talking about keeping the face switch turned on. Peter had a reputation and has a reputation today here on the earth. Do you know that Peter is the only other man in the Bible, outside of Jesus, the Son of God, who ever walked on water? None of the other disciples said, well, hey, Jesus, if Peter's going, command me too. Didn't happen, right? Just Peter walked on the water. And in fact, you know, I, I don't know of it. Maybe you know of it, but I don't. I've never heard of anyone else walking on water. Have you? So Peter, as far as we know, is the only Man, that's not the Son of God in the flesh, right? Whoever walked on water. That's his reputation. That's his testimony. He was a man of faith. You say, but what about the sinking? Well, here's the thing is that his face switch was on. He was looking at Jesus. He could see Jesus. He was coming to him on the water. And then what happened? His gaze started to drift down to the wind and waves. And what happened? He started to sink. But when he started to sink, he didn't cry out, boat, save me. He didn't say, disciples, throw me a line. He didn't say, wind and waves, stop it. I don't like you. What did he say? He said, Lord, say, what happened? The face switch was going down, but he flipped the switch back up. Lord, save me. Now, what happens when he cries out to the Lord? Look at this, verse number 31. And immediately... Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? That's one of my favorite words in the Bible. Do you know that? That word, immediately. I love that word. 
Because that word shows me that God cares. That shows me that God is there. That shows me that God is ready to receive me. See, when you keep the face switch turned on, you say, but pastor, I've had the face switch turned on. I've been confessing. I've been doing. I've been believing. And I still haven't seen my answer. Listen, you keep that face switch turned on. And just like Daniel, who, when the angel finally appeared, he said, the moment you prayed, the answer was coming. I've just been delayed. See, you will have that immediately moment when Jesus stretches out his hand and gets a hold of your life. And you will have what you've been believing God for. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Are we willing to step out of the boat on the water with nothing to support us but the word of God? We've got to keep the face switch turned on. Last thing for today, last thing for today is this. If we're going to obtain a good report, a good testimony, we have to look past the temporary to the eternal. Can't judge tomorrow by today's circumstances. Because where you're going tomorrow is not where you're at today. You're traveling onward and upward. And your faith will carry you to greater heights than you ever could imagine. You've got to keep the face switch turned on. But God wants to do great and mighty wonderful works in your life. And even if in this life nothing happens, you don't have any wealth, you don't have any breakthrough, you're sick, even if that was the case, but I don't believe it is. Because God looks after his word to perform it in this life and in the life to come. But even if he never did... He's still God, and in eternity, you will have a good report that you believe God and that you didn't get off your faith and that you followed through to the very end. That's what this is all about. We have to look past the temporary into the eternal. John Wesley, a great man, great reformer, great uh, uh, revivalist, great preacher, he said this. He said, I judge all things only by the price they shall gain in eternity. See, we need to have that eternal perspective in life. Doesn't matter what I spend here. Doesn't matter how much I give here. Doesn't matter how weak I am or, or, or how much loss or abuse or use I take here on the earth. If it's got value in eternity, then I will spend and be spent, the Apostle Paul says. And that's what this is all about. We need to keep our focus eternally. Hebrews 11, 2 in the New International Version says this is what the ancients were commended for. Some other translations say that the elders were approved by God for their faith. See, where do you want your name written? You want your name written in heaven or on earth? Because you can have your name written here on the earth. Absolutely you can. If you decide, hey, you know what? Eternal things don't matter. I want to make only an impact here on the earth. I want to build up wealth. And you want to be recorded as the richest man or the richest woman. You can have that. You can go after that. If you want to have your name written in the history books as a world changer, you can have that. If you want to have your name on plaques on walls or on buildings that say you bought those buildings or you did good works and, and, and served humanity, you can have that. You can have statues erected to you with your name on them or a headstone that has your name on it. And you can have your name written here on the earth. But let me tell you something about having your name written here on the earth. The Bible says with fervent heat and fire, all of the elements will be destroyed. So everything that's written about you is going to burn up. Or you can decide and choose to have your name written in heaven where neither wrath, moth nor rust destroy, where thief does not steal, and it will go on into eternity. Let's take a look at it in the Word of God, Jeremiah chapter 17. Old Testament now. Jeremiah chapter number 17. Jeremiah is praying and speaking to the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse number 13. Jeremiah says this, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you, shall be ashamed. There's that departing from the Lord. Remember that wavering that we talked about, like the waves of the ocean. And then the Lord responds to Jeremiah, and he says these words, those who depart from me shall be written in the earth. Wow. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. See, God is the source of all. As we keep that face switched on, God is the fountain of living waters. He will never run dry. And yet if we depart from him, our name will be written in the earth. And that name will be burned up when Jesus returns. The disciples are traveling with Jesus. Jesus sends them out. If you want to turn there in Luke chapter 10. Last verse for today, Luke chapter number 10. And, and Jesus gives them authority to heal the sick, to preach and teach about the kingdom of God and to cast out demons. And after they go out on their missionary journey, they come back to Jesus rejoicing. They're, 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 they're amazed. Things have been happening. People are getting healed, and they say, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. There's great, mighty, wonderful things happening here on the earth. And Jesus responds to them in Luke, the 10th chapter, verse number 20. Look at what he says. He says, nevertheless, 
Do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. See, we have to keep that eternal perspective that no matter what happens here on the earth, good, bad, or indifferent, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those who have given their heart and life to Jesus now, uh, there's been a record of heaven of our name. And, and listen, no, no man, no circumstance, no trial, no, nothing here on the earth can ever keep us away from that now. If we stay faithful and keep our faith on the Lord, now we are going to heaven and now our names are written. The Bible says in Hebrews the 13th chapter that the church of Almighty God who are registered in heaven, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life and we will go on into eternity. There was a missionary who was coming back from Africa with his wife long time ago, and they had to travel by boat. They got on the boat, and they were headed back to New York City, where they were going to retire. Only they didn't have any retirement money, didn't have any organization that was bringing them home. They were just unable any longer to perform their service there on the mission field, and so they were headed back home. There on the boat, they realized there was a whole lot of big to-do, and people were all excited and running and, and, and just making a big hustle and bustle about something going on. So they decided to see what it was, and they went over, and there's Theodore Roosevelt, the president. He was returning from a hunting trip in Africa, and everybody was all excited about him. Everybody was saying, oh, welcome, and, and we're glad that you're here, and all the dignitaries were coming over. And the old missionary man said, you know what? This is not right. You know, here's the president, and everybody's all excited about him. No one's excited to see us. We've given our lives. So they get back to the New York City Harbor, there they are, and they, they dock the boat, and as they dock the boat, there's a ticker tape parade. All the dignitaries, all the, the big wigs have come out, and they're excited about the president coming home, and there's a band playing, and all this pomp, and everything's going on. All for the president's hunting trip. And, and the missionary man looks at his wife and says, this is just not right. Decades of our life have gone into the mission field, and now here we are, and this is our reception. Everybody's all excited about the president doing what? Hunting? And yet we've been serving the Lord Winning souls to Jesus in Africa all these years and nobody even cares? And she says, honey, just, it's okay. It's okay. Just calm down. So they get an apartment on the Upper East Side and they start to look for work. And that night they're home and they have dinner. And the old missionary looks at his wife and says, I, I just can't get over this. I'm just so mad at God. I can't believe that this is what's going on. Can't believe this is how we're going to end our lives. This is not right. This is not fair. And she says, honey, you need to go and deal with the Lord about that. Talk to God about it. Stop talking to me about it. Thank God for a woman who can get in our face. Is that right, man? You say amen to that? So the old missionary goes back into his room. He's there for a couple minutes. And after a moment, he comes out with a big smile on his face. And everything's changed. And she looks at him. She says, whoa, whoa, wait a second. What happened? And he says, well, I started to tell the Lord. I just opened up and I just told God everything that was on my heart poured out my heart before him. I told him, Lord, this hurts. It's wrong. It's not right. Why should, why should the president have such a great reception? And why should he get all this fame? And why should he get all the accolades and everything? And yet we've given our lives in your service, Lord. And now when we come home, no one cares. And he says, and it was at that moment that it felt like the Lord put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, son, but you're not home yet. See, what matters is not what's here on the earth. What matters is that our names are written in heaven. And in our lives, if we're going to attain a good testimony by faith, we're going to have to do it God's way. We're going to have to choose faith every day above riches and gold and silver. We're going to have to keep the face switch turned on and keep our compass pointed true north. And we're going to have to keep our eyes on eternal things, not on temporary earthly things. Can we just give the Lord a praise for this series and for what God's done in our lives? Hallelujah. God is so good. God is good. You guys have been great today. I want to thank you guys for listening to the word of God. I really do believe you got something. Let's not stop there. Because be a tragedy, if we talked about eternity, talked about having our names written in heaven, and then we just assumed that everybody was right with God, we let you go, and you died, and you ended up in hell rather than going to heaven. Now, sometimes people hear that and they say, well, I don't like that. I, you, you know, you're, you're just offensive to me right now. I don't believe in hell. That's a story that parents made up to scare their children into being good, and, and I don't believe I'm going to go to hell. Well, that's convenient, but you know what? It, it's not reality. Because the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place, and just by burying your head in the sand doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to face the reality of it. 
And God is not some mean, sadistic egotist in the heavens delighting and sending people to hell. No, he grieves over the death of the unrighteous, the Bible says. He's not happy. Hell was never made for you or me. It was made for the devil and his angels that rebelled. And yet God loves us so much, he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross so that we wouldn't have to go to hell, that we could be with him forever and ever in heaven. And yet he gives us the free will choice with our lives while we're here on the earth, where we're going to go, whether it be heaven or whether it be hell. I want to just ask you that question. just want you to answer the question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. What if today was your last day? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, I, I know I'd go to heaven because all roads lead to heaven. Jesus went to the cross. He opened the way. It's just open now. You do whatever you want to do. I'll do whatever I want to do. You know, the church is out there. They can do their thing. That's cool with God, and everybody's going to make it there somehow, some way. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say that all roads lead to heaven. Any more than on the earth, all roads lead to the moon. Because that's about the same thing, what you're saying there. There's only one way you're going to get to the moon. In the same way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means can't get through your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption and carried it out in his son Jesus, don't you think after going to the cross, a beaten, bloody public spectacle for all to see, do you think after all that, that he would tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does, right here in his word. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's good news, Pastor, because I know that God lets good people into heaven. And that's got to be somewhere there in the Bible. Isn't that what Christianity is about? It's about being good. And, you know, I used to be bad, cleaned up my act. Now I'm good. And in fact, my good outweighs my bad now. I, I, I've been helping people out, been nice to my neighbors, giving money to charities. And I believe that God's going to see that and let me into heaven. But let me ask you a question. Could you just show that to me in the Bible where it says, be good and God will let you into heaven? Because it's not there. There's no grading scale, no curve, no line that you have to be above. Be this good and you get to go to heaven. In fact, if we're trying to get to heaven based on our goodness or our own merit, the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not gonna make it based on your goodness. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, okay, but you know, I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Born in America, America is a Christian nation. They took me to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child. We're born in America, it's a Christian nation. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible? Check it out. Nowhere does it say, parents raised you in church, tell you a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that if you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or Christian as a child, or be born in America, that you get to go to heaven because of those things. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Come on, can we talk about your eternal life today? Let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. Come on, you need to listen up because your eternal life's at stake. Some of you might have said, well, wait a second, Pastor, because not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church in front of you right now, and I consider myself to be a Christian. Doesn't that mean that I get to go to heaven? Well, no. Because no one in the Bible says just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Any more than I can go to my garage at my house, call myself a car, sit in my garage and say, I'm a car, and that makes me a car. No, just a guy sitting in his garage. Can't just call yourself a Christian, sit in church, and that makes you a Christian. You say, but okay, I get that, but you know, you don't understand, Pastor. My last church I got involved, I helped out, I sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader, I taught in the Bible class, I even got a membership card to that church. Doesn't that count for something? Well, yeah, it's wonderful, and I'm glad you did those things, but did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that that gets you into heaven, your church attendance and involvement? It doesn't work like that. God's not checking your volunteer hours, checking them off, or waiting at the gates of heaven, looking for your membership card before you can enter doesn't work like that. And if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. So he said, Pastor, but hold on a second. You don't understand. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know about God. I know about Jesus. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. I, I think that I'm a Christian because of that. Well, if you'd read your Bible, you'd know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. If you'd read your Bible, you know the devil himself knows who Jesus is and believes he's the Son of God and can quote scriptures out of his mouth 
And yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent, having head knowledge about who God is and that gets you right with God headed for heaven, denying hell. But rather this is about your heart. Remember we said it's not about behavior modification, but it's about heart transformation. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society has made that into a mockery. They raked it through the coals, made it out to be something that it's not some weirdo stuff. We don't want to have any part of that. Listen, it's not about what society says, books, movies, television, Hollywood, or the internet. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church today, right now. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are pretty gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying, lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, you call your choice. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Three, and when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. Let's get over that today. Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. And yet the devil's going to try and talk you out of it right now, tell you this isn't real. It's just your emotions. You're being pressured into this. Listen, the devil's putting the pressure on. I'm trying to direct you towards the things of God. Today, it's your call. It's your choice. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, hey, better than ending up in hell. Let's go on with God today. And can I tell you something? We've all done this. No one's judging you or criticizing you, condemning you. We're rooting for you and we're excited for you. This is a safe and friendly place that you can boldly lift your hand today and start your relationship with Jesus Christ. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Make sure before you leave this place. Who should raise their hand if you never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand in this place? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with Jesus Christ, acknowledging your need for him by raising your hand in a moment. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe, come on, put the burger down, get ready to get your hand up, and then telling us right afterwards you're coming to the church service. Online, across the nation, and around the world. If you're watching, hey, you can raise your hand, God sees, and then I want you to either click on the blue button that says, respond to God, or go to our homepage, rockchurch.com, and click on the button that says, how to know God, and someone will lead you in a prayer wherever you're at. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go, all together. If you need to do this, get ready to get your hand up. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. Thank you. There's four up there. Got you over there. There's five. Thank you. Over here, six. Thank you. Seven up top. Over here. Got you. Got you on that side. About six or seven. Eight. Got you up there. Thank you. Thank you. Who else today? No, you need to give God all of your heart. No, you need to give God all of your life. There's about eight white people already. Thank you up there. Number nine. Got you. God bless you. Who else today? Nine over here. Ten. Got you. Thank you. Thank you over there. Eleven up front. Got you right here. God bless you. Who else today? About eleven wise people. No, you need to give God all of your heart. Thank you. Twelve. No, you need to give God all of your life. Anybody else? Come on. Just raise it up. I didn't embarrass them. Won't embarrass you. Go for it. Come on. We're excited for you. If this is you and your heart's beating out of your chest, you're saying, I wonder if he's talking to me. 
God's speaking to you. I'm talking to you. Go for it. Come on. Come on. If that's you, you know God just spoke to you. Just lift it up high for me. About a dozen wise people. Anybody else? Real quick. Just raise it up high for me when I'm looking in your direction. Thank you, 13. God bless you. Who else today? Thank you, 14 on this side. Got you over there. God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick. About 14 wise people. Is there 15? 15 up top. Got you over there. Come on. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Hallelujah. Good, good, good. All right, now listen, the Lord just whispered something in my ear. All right, if God can speak to me about the word, he can speak to me about your heart and your life, where you're at. Fifteen of you raised your hands, but there were five more of you that should have raised your hand, but you didn't. So all 20 of you, here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand and give a clap and a shout. That's your cue. Get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, no one leaves during this time. I'm trying to get them to come this way, okay? But if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. But we can't do that until we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. Come on, let's give them a great big clap and a shout. And you come right now. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, grab your stuff from a friend. Get in the aisle and come front. Come on down right now. By your grace I'm standing here. Come on. This is your time. This is your moment. And no matter the road I walk. From the family rooms, you can bring your children. They'll remember this. I They're coming. It's true. They're coming. Come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on. Come on. Come on. By your grace, I'm standing here. You know you need to come. Just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Come on down. It's not too late. We got room for you. Come on down. And I realize it's true there's like you. Anybody else, if you need to come, just make your way to the front. Come on down right now. That's you. Nudge your neighbor. Say, come on, friend. I'll go with you. All right, thank God you guys have come. Where's everybody from this section? Hey, you guys came. We're so excited for you, excited for what God's going to do in your heart and your life. This is the best decision of your entire life right here. That's awesome. We're right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel, really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? You already got past this guy, okay? He's cool. All right, he's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. You're not wondering or concerned, okay? First thing he's going to do, he's going to pray with you. Simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, just like we talked about. Brand new life from the inside out. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do next? Okay, he'll give that to you. It's absolutely free. And then he's going to introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. It's easy. It's free. He'll describe how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you. Okay, now listen, listen, listen. Give us a year, one year of your life here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, sitting consistently under the teaching and the Word of God. And after that year, I promise, you'll look around your life and you'll say, my goodness, I am so blessed. I did not know it could be like this, okay? But it takes you investing your heart and your life into the things of God, sitting consistently under the Word of God and applying those things to your life week after week. And then after that year, my goodness, you're gonna look around and say, I'm just blessed. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, take their word for it, okay? You guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God. I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known 
in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.